Hi guys, I wanted to make this video about the comparative, which seems to cause a lot of hardship for many students. So the comparative question appears on paper two, obviously it's worth 70 marks, making it the biggest section. It covers three texts, and when I say texts, I use the term loosely because one of these could be a film, um, one could be a play, and um, then you could study a novel, it all sort of depends. There are um, a number of, of texts on the syllabus and a possible uh, over 7,000 combinations you can study, so obviously I can't cover all of them. But the point of this video really is to explain the different modes of comparison and try and help you generalize so as so that you can apply this to your own set of texts. So the suggested time for this question is 55 minutes and you know this is not gospel you should really allocate your time yourself, practice, break up the paper, see what you think. Um, the suggested length is 5 A4 pages for sort of average to slightly big handwriting. Um, because it's the biggest section on the paper that's why I'm saying um, do invest the time into it. Having said that, um, there's the issue of diminishing returns, so you don't need to um, really throw in all your effort into um, this question at the expense of uh, other questions. And the thing about it being uh, the biggest question, poetry uh, taking prescribed and unseen together is worth the same amount. Uh, but in and of itself, it's the biggest section. So the real key here is to compare two texts at a time because people get a little bit flustered. How do I compare three texts? Two texts at a time and try and always compare. So rather than having chunks about a single text, try and get every second sentence, if not every sentence, to contain something about two texts or always talk about a comparison rather than uh, talking about uh, a particular text. Um, you're going to have to use link words. So there are things like similarly, equally, likewise, you know, King Lear contrasts with King's speech. Uh, King Lear is not unlike King's speech in that those kind of things. So the examiner will probably be looking out for those. And just like referencing the key terms from the question, which is something that I, I mention a lot, um, being cognizant of the need to use these link words will keep you honest as well, because then you will be focusing on making comparisons rather than sort of going off analyzing each text. So the key here isn't to go for depth the same way that you would in a poetry question or the way you would in a single text question. Um, obviously insights are great, but the key here is to be making comparisons. That's kind of the, the name of the game with this section. Um, so there are four modes of comparison and that's where it gets really complicated. So people understand, okay, so I have to compare three texts. But when you start talking about uh, the different modes of comparison that it gets really complicated. So in this video I'm going to focus on general vision and viewpoint and cultural context. Uh, theme, theme or issue and literary genre are covered on the website as well but I'm just going to talk through these um, so as to demystify them as such. So general vision and viewpoint. Essentially you want to talk about is the author an optimist or are they a pessimist? So I decided that rather than going straight into the serious texts and making it complicated and possibly mentioning texts that you're not familiar with and just further confusing you, I decided I'll go straight for the most infantile pop culture that I could find. And we're going to look at a general vision and viewpoint comparison between Snow White and Cinderella. Bear with me, you're going to like this. So, good versus evil is explored in both Snow White and Cinderella. 
Cinderella's family situation is challenging, just like Snow White's. So obviously you can see the um, link words compared, uh, the link words uh, highlighted here. Their biographies have much in common. The two women are left initially without their mothers, then they suddenly lose their fathers and face their evil stepmothers. The contrast between the benevolent main character versus the malevolent stepmother appears in both texts. After subjecting the main character to these horrifying challenges, the authors eventually reward the readers of both texts with a happy ending. So, okay, it's crazy and grotesque, but you get the point that you're using link words, you're comparing two texts at a time, you're not retelling the story uh, outside of making the comparisons, and you're not going into a huge amount of depth. So obviously, when you talk about um, general vision and viewpoint, you want to talk about the important characters, uh, possibly the key moments, the evolution of general vision and viewpoint. So did it start off really gloomy and end well? Um, it may not necessarily apply here, but they're just things to think about. So <clears throat> now we're going to upgrade to uh, proper grown-up texts. So here we're going to look at Hamlet and King's Speech. And honestly, even if you're, if you're completely unfamiliar with um, both of these texts, it doesn't matter because all you need to um, take away from this is how it's done. And then you can kind of mimic it, make it your own, and apply it to your own essay. Um, so, both Hamlet and King's speech express views on kingship. They both note the importance of politics in maintaining power. Claudius consults his advisors prior to his marriage to Gertrude and takes great care instructing his negotiators about Norway. George V's uh, firm power dwindled quickly as his health deteriorated. He knew the importance of appearing powerful to the public hence the pressure on Bertie to speak with impact. Like the playwright, the director shows deep insights into the complexity of power. So it may seem like there is a chunk in there when I'm kind of retelling the story without really making comparisons, but it seems that it's absolutely necessary sometimes to have a couple of sentences where you're just uh, setting the scene. And obviously, the deeper you go into your essay, um, the less uh, there will be a requirement for context and you can kind of further elaborate into the comparison part. Um, so two conflicting views of power are portrayed through Claudius and Bertie. Claudius, a younger brother, took drastic action to become king, whereas Bertie knows his place and considers it treacherous to even imagine himself as king. Given the comparably happier ending of King's speech, it seems that its author has a brighter view of legit legitimately attained power. So when you look back at this, really the first chunk, it can be transplanted into uh, more or less any uh, comparative essay, but it's the paragraph that follows that talks about good versus bad and you know good versus evil and what is the... Uh, the vision, is it optimistic or is it pessimistic? So you're trying to uh, really compare the two texts in terms of what it reflects about um, the author. And the word author as well is great because um, you can have, you know, a novelist, a director, a playwright. Um, it, it's, it's difficult to always uh, use the, the proper term, but if you use author, it's kind of, you know, it, it's a it's a really neutral kind of term. You can, you can use it if you're lost for, um, for a way to describe the, the guy in charge as such. Um, the other thing is, a lot of the time people get a little bit confused. Well, how do I write the introduction? And I keep making this point that it's difficult to write an introduction unless you know what's going to be in the main part. So a trick that I uh, mention sometimes is write the main part and then having left, you know, five or seven lines at the top of your essay, come back and, and write it uh, when you know what uh, it's going to be about. So here is just an example of um, an introduction that um, you can do for a general vision and viewpoint essay. Again, don't worry about the exact text, just 
keep your eye on the structure and um, the, the form of uh, and the tone of what you're going to be talking about. So the general vision and viewpoint is undoubtedly shaped by the reader's feelings of optimism or pessimism in reading the text. In it, it is the view on life that emerges in the reader's interpretation of the text and is therefore shaped by each individual reader. So here um, we're setting the scene, we're explaining what general vision and viewpoint is, uh, which is a completely legitimate thing to do uh, at the start of the essay. So during my comparative course, I have studied The Dead by James Joyce, Citizen Kane, uh, directed by and starring Orson Welles, uh, and Wuthering Heights by uh, Emily Bronte. Uh, the general vision and viewpoint of each of these texts relate and diverge in a number of interesting ways, with feelings of both optimism and pessimism emerging at sundry points throughout. So it's always a good idea to mention the texts that you're going to be talking about um, in the introduction, especially in um, a comparative question. Um, a lot of the time this advice is also given for poetry questions, so list out the poems that you're going to talk about. It's slightly more optional in the poetry essay, but for the comparative question, definitely um, it, it's, it's always a good idea to um, include all the texts because straight away, you know, once you dive into the main part, the game is on, how many comparative uh, points can you score? Um, so this is a very kind of um, plain vanilla introduction to um, general vision and viewpoint question. So just have a look at it. If it resonates with you, pick up maybe the turn of phrase that you find good here and adapt it and make it your own in your own essays. So moving on to cultural context, uh, it's all about society. So we'll go wild again and we'll talk about Cinderella, Little Mermaid and Snow White. So the role of magic is what we're going to talk about. So um, magic here stands in for things like gender, race, money, status, class, all those kind of things. So we're going to talk about magic. The role of magic is explored in all three texts, Cinderella, Little Mermaid and Snow White. In Cinderella, magic is entirely on the side of the main character whereas Little Mermaid nearly loses her life after engaging with dark magic. Snow White portrays both sides of the force. Snow White is first poisoned through magically uh, enabled deceit by her stepmother and then rescued by an equally magical true love's kiss. The reader is captivated by both the evil images of magic, the evil stepmother and the poisoned apple, as well as the miraculous kiss that breathes life into a still Snow White. Equally, the powerful image of the hurried Cinderella instills the importance of magic in her society. We can see three differing roles for magic in each of these cultures. Okay, so I know it's ridiculous, but again, the thing here is, is that you're looking at a particular angle within cultural context and you're approaching, you're trying to uh, explain how this is explored in each of the three texts. So let's move on to cultural context uh, in our proper leading cert texts. So King's Speech and the Great Gatsby uh, mentioned here. Again, it doesn't really matter if you know anything about these, just watch out for the comparisons, watch out for um, the comparative wor words and the structure. The other thing to note is that while the examiners are obviously well prepared, they may not know all the texts in absolute overwhelming detail like you do. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, there are about 30 something texts that you could study and the examiners will obviously be familiar with them, but uh, make, it, make it easy for them. So see if this reads in a way that makes it easy for you to understand how these two texts are um, different and the same because that's what the examiner will have to do on the day. And obviously we want to make everything super easy for the examiner because they are the ones who give us the marks. Right, so money and status are explored in both King's speech and The Great Gatsby. The king doesn't even carry money. While Bertie is an endearing character on so many levels, 
he is very aware of his elevated status. Similarly, Gatsby seems to continuously be aware of his wealth. However, Gatsby insecurely competes with old money and tries to cover up his roots, whereas to Bertie, it is a birthright. Both characters end up in a role they didn't foresee. Gatsby only became rich as a consequence of meeting Daisy, and Bertie didn't expect to become king. We see that in both cultures, status of birth is very important to how one's life unfolds. To Bertie, the common man is almost like a different species. In contrast, Gatsby must understand it fully. Bertie becomes very irate when a border is crossed and infringing on his status. Still, he pauses and understands the message that Logue is trying to convey by being blasphemous with the regalia. Gatsby, on the other hand, seems to lack such insight. Logan and Carraway are contrasting characters in how they treat figures of superior social status. Their digni dignity is clearly important to both of them, but Carraway shows greater deference. So again, here you see all the um, words that link up the comparisons, and you see how money and status, um, things like you know wealth and class, or other names for that, um, are Compared and contrasted here in, in, in two texts, we've mentioned uh, one or two key moments, we've mentioned a bunch of important characters, we've mentioned the evolution of uh, the role of money and status within the lives of these characters. So um, that's kind of what you're going to have to do in uh, the essay for your own text as well. So um, here is an introduction that was written for um, a question, the full essay, all of this, the full, for, for all of these, the full essays are available online. Um, we'll give you the link at the end. Um, but this is a particularly good introduction, kind of explaining once again what uh, cultural context really is. So attitudes and expectations tend to be entrenched very, very deeply in human culture. Social change as it relates to an individual or of any standing is a function of these attitudes. Deep-seated stereotypes of how a monarch should marry and sound, what circles a nouveau riche could be accepted in and what political views to expect in a working class dwelling are just part of any society's uh, context. Each individual's circumstances are often driven by societal norms though we sometimes meet a character who defies the odds. For my comparative course, I have studied the following texts, the novel The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald, the play The Plan of the Stars by Sean O'Casey, and finally the film The King's Speech, directed by Tom Hooper. I will refer to them, and that's actually a good trick to abbreviate the um, names of the um, texts, because you'll spend so much time rewriting them over and over again and uh, you're not necessarily going to get any marks for that so just um, abbreviate them. Um, this is a, really a marvellous introduction because um, unlike the one that we've read before which is also great this one makes it very specific to the text so um, the nouveau riche is obviously the great Gatsby, the monarch is obviously um, the king in King's speech and um, sort of the working class dwelling thing and responding to society's expectation um, that relates to the plough and the stars. So guys, you will be able to read the full versions on www.625points.com um, so the full essays are available, but some of this came from the guides, uh, English 2017 and 2018. They cover the entire syllabus, so there's plenty of tips, tricks, and sample answers with actual past questions, with the full question given and the year, uh, and so on and so forth. So. Um, it's really my pleasure to keep answering your questions. This video was made in response to your Snapchat queries. So keep sending them in and I look forward to making more of these videos. I hope this helped you.